There we go. Okay. John Fusco from National Patent Analytic Systems has driven all the way up from Mansfield, Ohio. He's the president of National Patent Analytic Systems. He also offers a more comprehensive course than what you're receiving here today. Two, three days. It's like two and a half days. Two and a half days. Yeah. A little bit more intense than this, and I encourage you that if he's got the time and they offer this course again in the future, take it. Um, you're going to get more into the science of breath alcohol testing. Um, certainly you're receiving it from the manufacturer's perspective, uh, but John is very honest about this, okay? On issues such as like breath to blood correlation issues, his attitude is, hey, you know, they tell us to make an instrument that meets these specifications, that does these things, we do it and we do it as best as we possibly can. And that's a pretty fair response. Uh, John, uh, I've known him for probably, I don't know, eight while. years, nine years, something like that. Yeah, been a while. So, but uh, they, uh, they're very helpful down down there in Mansfield. You know, if you've got a question, if you've got an issue, you know, they they always go that extra mile. And unlike uh, like the Intoxilizer 5000 people, they will reveal their source code. I don't encourage you to do it because it's long, it's tedious, and it costs a lot of money to have engineers go through it. They'll do it pursuant to a protective order, but they've got an open door policy on that. As long as the proper protective order is entered. They'll reveal their source code to you, so I don't think that there's any issues there. When it was done, actually, the, the one time that somebody did invest enough money into it, they came up with a strange little equation that they couldn't uh, understand what it meant. And what was that little equation? It was it's the, the Beer-Lambert Law. There you go. There you go. Beer-Lambert Law, <coughs> which is that's central the, to breath testing. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So John's going to take over now, and I'm going to go okay. have a seat. I am totally unprepared. Uh, there we are, you're right, you're right. But I am John Fusco, and uh, <clears throat> at this point, if I could get Mac Forrester from Intoximeters to quit coming into work, I would be the longest serving principal in the industry. I've been at it since 1974. Uh, I don't know a lot about anything, but I know a little bit about almost everything, enough to be dangerous. Probably, and all I can do is impart some of this to, to you guys. So I'm going to leave this very much open. If you got questions, you know, yell it out. If you got an area you want me to cover, uh, in particular, <coughs> go ahead. The only thing I was thinking on the way up here was that the one thing that's new uh, with the new instrument in Michigan is the. Uh, uh, the use of dry gas for simulator testing. Uh, and I can give you a quick review of that so you understand what we're doing there and hopefully eliminate any possible misconceptions on it. Uh, <clears throat> Bill sort of ended off with the, right at the chemistry of <coughs> infrared testing. And since I've been asked to talk a little bit on the data master, which is the instrument that analyzes it, I can probably pick up there and highlight this a little bit for you and <clears throat> give you maybe a little bit of a different perspective uh, on this. <coughs> Bill was talking about wavelengths. Um, and he got into the sort of the electromagnetic spectrum. All right, but from a, a big, from the big viewpoint, how does this apply to ethanol? Okay, we're talking about detecting using a certain wavelength, right? Or doing things with a certain wavelength. And I was in, uh, it's amazing what you can do with these wavelengths of energy. I was in uh, Northern Illinois Wednesday looking at a business because uh, we do other things besides breath testing. We make high current contactors for military aircraft also. That's another product that we make. And we make a few other products also. Um, and the guy shows me a console type thing that had Westinghouse across the front. And uh, very simple little device. On top of it, there's a, looks like a little copper tube coming out eighth inch diameter, it comes out <coughs> on the table, goes around, makes a couple of circles, and then goes back down in. So there's a little circular affair. 
and you can put things in. And he turns this thing on, it looks like it's right down to the 1930s. And he said, you know, this uses vacuum tubes yet. Yeah. I said, oh great, you know, where do you use tubes? He said, it's still, it's still building, okay? <coughs> it's called an RF generator, radio frequency generator, okay? And he lets this thing fire up for two, three minutes. And he takes a soldered assembly, which is a, a cap basically soldered onto a box. And he puts it down into this little wire thing I was telling you about, just like this, right inside. Leaves it there for about a minute, pulls it out, and it had desoldered itself. <laughs> the radio frequencies heated up that that assembly so much <coughs> that it actually melted the solder. The solder melts at, well, some of it melts around 400 degrees, others up around 700, this sort of thing, okay? So it's amazing what you can do with this stuff. But in, in alcohol breath testing, this is what the molecule of alcohol looks like. C2H5O. Okay, there's five atoms of hydrogen, two of carbon, <coughs> and one of oxygen. Actually, just that H doesn't really belong there. I think of oxygen, for some reason I want to put an H on it. Different frequencies cause these bonds, these are molecular bonds, they actually hold the atoms together, so to speak. <coughs> this is actually a range. 3.44 microns is a range, which if we had Bill's electromagnetic spectrum up there, you would see that. It's a, it's a certain frequency, an infrared frequency of, of energy, and that's a, a wavelength is 3.44 microns. <coughs> now actually this 3.4 <coughs> range is a good range for ethanol, and, I, and I'll show you that in a minute, okay? But what happens is in the presence of infrared energy at 3.44 microns or 3.42 or 3.46, sir? Uh, do these, do these machines, can they tell the difference between I isotopal methanol and We're going to get into that. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna, it, it, fire the questions as they come up. If it's something I'm going to talk about, I'll put you off. <coughs> if not, I'll go ahead and, and answer it. It, it makes for a little smoother presentation that way. In the presence of that frequency, these bonds start to vibrate. Okay. In the process of vibrating, they use up some of the energy. So <clears throat> the whole principle of an infrared spectrophotometer, and, and this is what a what the data master really is, it's a very limited infrared spectrophotometer, more properly called a, a photometric, because we only use a, a couple of filters. We don't use the whole range. Okay. <clears throat> If we know how much of this energy was present before the alcohol came into the sample chamber, and we record that, whether it be, well, it's in terms of a voltage output, actually. So let's say in the, in the presence of <coughs> no alcohol, our voltage output was one volt, okay? Put the alcohol in the sample chamber, Maybe it gets used, used up by the bond. Maybe use a different marker that shows up a little better. There's bad, yeah. Well, I'm close, I can see it all right. <laughs> uh, good. <clears throat> Let's try this. There we go, that's a little better. Get this one over here. <clears throat> what happens is, as this molecule, as these atomic bonds use up the energy, this voltage output drops, okay? So that 
at some level of ethanol, you may have zero volts getting through. Well, those aren't the actual voltages, but for purposes of demonstration, that's it. Okay. So, <coughs> if you can measure this drop-off, then you can quantify how much ethanol is present in the sample. <coughs> That's the whole purpose of an infrared spectrophotometer that does gas. And the data master is, first and foremost, a gas analyzer that is geared to measure ethanol. Okay? <coughs> Got any questions on that at all? Is that kind of... So, just so I understand, because this is what happens is when you blow into the chamber, then the infrared light is shot through the chamber, right? Yeah, let, let me draw a picture of that. Because I don't, I don't know if I do that. And then you can even look at it on uh, Bill's uh, units back there, if you like. <coughs> we have first a not that great either, is it? It's real black. Hear that, or maybe it's holding these things the wrong way or they drain off. This is an infrared lamp. We call it an IR source. Okay? These are, in most cases, the, I'm going to talk in terms of the data master. Well, these things will generally apply to other instruments also, although there's going to be some differences. Okay, but since you don't use other instruments in Michigan, we'll kind of limit our time on those. That would be without value to you, pretty much. This is an infrared source. It burns extremely hot. You can see it if you know where to look on the instrument. If you turn it on, you'll see a dull orange glow. And in fact, the orange that you see is perfectly useless because we're not interested in the visible portion of the infrared. We're actually using other portions. But, but <clears throat> this thing is going to produce infrared energy of a whole bunch of wavelengths. Okay? Simply because it's sitting there and heated, and there's nothing to keep it from not producing energy at all these different wavelengths. <coughs> you focus this into a sample chamber, <coughs> okay? In the case of the data master, the sample chamber is folded. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's called resolution. In short, the farther that the infrared energy needs to travel through the sample, the more opportunity there is for it to be absorbed. Okay? So the more sensitive the instrument becomes. Right? So what we do is the infrared energy is actually going in here. <coughs> we use mirrors. bounce this thing three times before it exits. <coughs> this sample chamber is sealed. Okay? This way we can take, <coughs> depending on the model of instrument, uh, an eight or a nine inch three hole tube, and make it up to 26, 27 inches, which is what we want for our optical, what we call the optical path, okay? From there, we need to get this onto a detector. <coughs> our detector is kind of neat, and it's what sets us off from other, from other breath testers. Our detector is called a lead selenide detector. That's the material that it's made of, is lead selenide, okay? Lead selenide is sensitive 
from 0 to 5 microns. After that, you can't use it. Now, you saw Bill a little earlier tell you there's instruments out there that work at 9.3 microns, 5,000, these type of things. Okay? <clears throat> we can't operate there because of our detector. So you might say, well, why don't you get a detector where you can operate up there and operate both places? It's too expensive. You can't do that. You can get a low price detector <coughs> that will, in fact, uh, do a fairly good job across the spectra. Okay? The difficulty is you can't chop it that fast. And that's the next step that I want to tell you about on the data master. When this energy exits, <coughs> and before it gets to the detector, when we take it and we run it through an optical chopper, which is simply a wheel with a whole bunch of holes through it. <coughs> okay? I'm taking this wheel which was sitting here like this, I just turned it around so you can see the front of it. The infrared energy goes right through this wheel. The wheel is spinning, okay, and it spins at about 125 hertz. <coughs> now, since there's, I think, six windows on it, that's going to produce an AC sine wave on the detector. In other words, what the detector is going to see is going to be alternating periods of light and dark because we're blocking that infrared energy four times with the, or six times with every re every resolution. Uh, John, just I'm uh, sorry for interrupting, but just to be clear, my understanding, so the wheels spin around. There's not different filters on each one of the little openings. No. It's just it's simply just open space. Open space. Open space. Okay. <coughs> All we're interested in doing is chopping that energy. So if you were to put a voltmeter on this thing or an oscilloscope on the back of the detector, <coughs> what you're going to see is this. You're going to see a, a sine wave coming off of there of about 30 millivolts. Or 1 30th, I think, of a volt, 30 millivolt. Now, the reason is for this is in order to create a usable signal to process, all right, we need to have an AC signal. A DC signal would be a flat line, and we can't use a flat line on our electronics. Okay, flat line is not sensitive enough for us, it just doesn't do what we need it to do. So we convert it to an AC signal. <coughs> we do that with the chopper wheel right here. Now, we also have to get to that number there. Remember I said this IR source is emitting all wavelengths in the heat range. We're not interested in all the wavelengths. We're only interested in the wavelength that is going to excite these molecules that I had up here. The way we do that is we use optical filters, more precisely called narrow band pass filters. The reason why we do that is because we can then allow only the infrared energy that we're concerned with or that we want to pass and block all the rest of them. And that's what we do. Right. Is that filter located on the IR source? Is that no, our filters on the data master <coughs> and the DMT are located <coughs> on separate assemblies and they're brought into the optical path as needed. Uh, CMI rotates filters on their chopper wheel. Um, Drager glues the detectors 
right to the front of the, or glues the filters to the front of the detectors. Uh, CMI does that also. <coughs> but see, they're using a little different setup. And this is what really distinguishes the data master from all other instruments. They also need to arrive at an AC sine wave. One way or another, <coughs> they got to get a sine wave. They can't process a signal. They get it a little differently. What they do is they take this source and they turn it on and off as fast as they can, electronically. Just like standing over to the light switch, doing that. Four times a second. In case of the 8,000, twice a second. Okay? This has a lot of, it's got some benefits. Number one, it's cheap. It's a really cheap way to do things. Because when you're using a, a source like that, that's called a pyroelectric detector, or a pyroelectric, um, wait a minute, pyroelectric detector. The source lamp is, doesn't have a special name, I guess. <coughs> it's, it's a dime to work with a pyroelectric detector. Okay. The source lamp is a a very thin film mass, so that when you apply a voltage to it or a current, as the case may be, it heats up. But when you break the contact, it cools very quickly. Okay. It's not like the element you would see on a heater where it gets red and then it gradually goes back to being red. <coughs> this thing gets red and in the space of a quarter second, it'll cool. Because it has no it has very little mass to it, so it it gets rid of the energy very quickly. It does the same thing as this does. That's what it gives you. Except it only gives you, in the case of the 8,002 a second, because that's as fast as they can run it. Okay? <clears throat> and in fact, the best of this technology won't get you back to 10 a second. Okay, difference here. We take this wheel, and the end result is we can up the speed of our system to 525 hertz. All right, they take that, and the best they can do is four hertz. Where does this pan out at? You see the huge difference in processing of invalid samples. We catch invalid samples, which is supposedly mouth alcohol, but it could be anything, all right? An invalid sample we can talk about after a bit, simply caused by a downward movement of the reading when it shouldn't be going down. We don't try to say what it is. We don't know, okay? How well you can do at invalid samples depends on how fast your system is operating. Because we're following a curve. Bill drew it a little bit ago, an alcohol curve that goes like that. What we're looking for is any deviation on this curve that shouldn't be there. Okay? That deviation can take place in a very, very small period of time. In fact, the number that we're looking for is uh, any more than two consecutive downward readings. Uh, which is created by an average, actually, will trigger an invalid sample. Okay? Now, we can pick that up in a heartbeat, running at 500 hertz. Okay? They got a problem. Will, <coughs> when you, if you intentionally try to defeat the data master by swishing alcohol and then blowing, okay, 
approximately 90% of the time, we'll nail it. Okay, the other 10% you're gonna get through if, when you get good at it. <laughs> and I'll tell you how to get good at it in a little bit, okay. There is a way you can do that. <coughs> but right now, let's go with this. So, you got your source lamp, you got your sample chamber, and then you got your filters. Usually two, sometimes three. <coughs> the filters allow you to come back to only that frequency. Any questions on this part? <coughs> what does Hertz mean? How does that translate to RPMs? Hertz is a, a measurement of frequency. I'm so, um, I, I can't hear you. Pardon? I couldn't hear you. Hertz is a measurement of frequency. Uh, usually expressed in per seconds, although it could be per hour or whatever. Is this it, is, is it, how many times has it spin around? It's fi it, the, the final result, this is in seconds. <coughs> this starts out with, with six, <coughs> six holes. Spinning of the thing, okay, works it up to an output of five, approximately 525 hertz. And we can control that very precisely simply by regulating the speed of the motor that's driving this wheel. Okay? So effectively, we've got 525 uh, of these guys. <laughs> okay? A minute, or a second, I'm sorry. You have to look at it on the oscilloscope to see it. It's very quick. We're, you know, we're, we're getting the job. This is, all, we've, this has been the same, by the way, since the early 80s. That hasn't changed. We haven't figured out a better way to do it. We have changed the way we're pulling the filters into the path. <coughs> A number of years ago, we did reduce the length of the sample chamber. In fact, we've done that twice because we're way, way overkill on the length of the sample chamber. Um, but this concept, the filter specifications, the detector specifications are identical to the instruments that were made in the early 1980s. Haven't changed. Any other question on that? I'm sorry? The filters? Yeah. Let me draw another picture of this. <coughs> if we take that infrared spectrum that Bill had on the board, and let's blow it up so that only the 3.4 area, 3.5 area, is shown. Well, we'll let it go out of the That's okay. <clears throat> this back out to. These are all expressed in microns, okay? No, that's the only micron. <coughs> if we look at the fingerprint pattern that's created by ethanol, okay, you've heard of this, people identifying things by fingerprints or whatever they call it, because it's unique. In the infrared spectra, this would be a pattern that would be relatively unique to ethanol. Okay? Ethanol kind of looks like this. The peak of ethanol <coughs> is actually what I should draw this the other way. There we go. The shoulder is actually over here. 
was on the other side. This is charting the absorption of the ethanol. On this side here would be percent transmission, which doesn't mean a whole lot to you. But if we were to put this on a chart, this is what ethanol is going to look like. Okay? There's a shoulder over here. The peak is here. It's just about 3.4. We're off the peak a little bit. 3.44 is where we're at. So we're actually sitting over here on a shoulder. Now, there's a reason for that. The reason is there's a whole lot of things that also absorb at 3.4. I mean, most any hydrocarbon is going to show up at 3.4. Okay? Years ago, I mean, this probably became the best known because this resulted in a lawsuit in the state of Missouri. Missouri wanted to buy the older intoxilizers, but they made a mistake on the specifications. Okay? The intoxilizers at that time had one filter in them, not two. Okay? The filter was down around, I think it was 3.39, which means it was sitting somewhere right, right around in here. Well, they went out on bid, and in the specifications they wrote, must be specific for ethanol. Okay? Well, CMI got the bid. Well, CMI at the time, yeah, it was still located in Colorado. These were way back. This was back in the late 70s, or early, mid-70s. Matt Forrester, who owned intoximeters, <coughs> got pretty upset. And he said, well, you put it in your specs, but 3.39 is not specific for ethanol. And he was right. It's not. Okay? <clears throat> You're going to... Anything is going to come out, particularly at the time the concern was acetone. Why acetone? Because of diabetics. State of ketosis, okay? Here's what acetone looks like. <clears throat> <coughs> this is the operative area. These John two interfere. Excuse me, John, molecularly, though, they are similar also, right? They well, yeah, they've got to have, they're going to have that hydrocarbon bond. There's one there. extra hydrocarbon. Yeah, yeah, the they're similar. Acid. Yeah, they're similar. So your current DMT has been able, is an improvement on the acetone detection? Well, yeah, let's finish this. No, okay, go we'll, on. Yeah, we're going to go into that. <clears throat> so Mac was right. Right? Missouri withdrew the bid, bought some offbeat instrument they were never happy with. <laughs> but essentially, it was a gas chromatograph. All right? So they could be very specific at that point. <clears throat> a few years later, they turned around and bought BAC verifiers from me, all right? So what did, what did the, the industry do to counter this? Well, <clears throat> you add another filter. And what happens is you put in a filter that's more sensitive to acetone than it is to alcohol. You calibrate the instrument using only ethanol, okay? And when you do, you're going to have a relationship. Between these two readings. So this filter is going to have X value, whatever it is, in the presence of no alcohol or no acetone. And this filter is going to have a certain value in the presence of, of alcohol. <coughs> and this ratio
is married into the memory of the instrument. It's married into the software. So that every time that instrument takes a reading, it looks for, among other things, this ratio. Because when you get acetone present, or you get anything else present, absorbance at these two filters is not going to be the same as it would be if you have only alcohol present. And that's how we identify whether or not there's a, a compound present that would be or could be additive to the reading. Okay? Now, it works extremely well for <coughs> acetone because acetone is extremely easy to identify. I mean, it's got a really distinct curve on it. Okay? <coughs> you can nail it real close. Alcohol's got a distinct curve. You move this filter off onto the shoulder and basically you're not even being influenced by, by acetone or it's almost negligible. So acetone works really easy. What doesn't work that easily are some of the other alcohols. Okay, for instance, methanol. Methanol looks like this. I mean, it covers the whole damn range. We're gonna play hell detecting methanol. <coughs> we moved a filter up to 3.5 And we do a pretty good job of, of, of looking at methanol, but not as good as acetone. What's methanol used in? Uh, and what is it? Sterno. It's a type of alcohol. It's a wood alcohol. You find it to very small degree in some alcoholic beverages, uh, unless they're unless the distiller is less than ethical in which case you kill people, okay? Case, because it's extremely toxic. It's very toxic. But you can find very, very small amounts. It, it's, they call it wood alcohol, okay? There's other alcohols too. I mean, there's isopropanol. Isopropanol. And that's based on oil. Pardon? And that's based on oil. Uh, the alcohols are not a, no, they're not derived from alcohol, from oils. I see. Isopropyl? No. Isopropyl? No, I don't believe so. What's it based on? The, the natural fermentation for most alcohols of somewhere. I mean, I don't know the chemistry that well. That Ethanol is natural fermentation. Alcohol is a carbon chain or a single carbon atom with a hydroxyl on the side. Hydroxyl is OH. Anytime you have a carbon or a carbon chain with an OH on the side, it's an alcohol. If you have one carbon, it's methanol. If you have two carbons, it's ethanol. If you have three carbons, it's propanol. You can go on and on as many carbons as you want to get. The there question is, so there's a lot of alcohol. Yeah, yeah there's a ton of it. But what does isopropyl do? <coughs> isopropyl is... Uh, Remember Kitty Dukakis? She went to the hospital from drinking isopropyl. Yeah, but... That's what, but what's uh, it come from? Yeah. People right, that really three good. carbons with uh, hydroxide. That means nothing to me. <laughs> he, ethanol has two carbons. <coughs> coming out. English, <coughs> Spanish, <coughs> Portuguese. Draw the picture, like you did before. It's the three. <coughs> That's the where it comes from. Now. Where, where does it, it come, come from? from? I don't know. Well, how they, they, I mean, if they make that it, I can't answer. Chemically, they make it. They make it. I don't know. I can just tell you how it's built. Yeah. And what it, what it looks like. It's three carbons. Ethanol has one carbon. Yeah, the only place I know that isopropanol uh, comes from na as a product of natural uh, of natural production is is a reversal of uh, the the uh, bodily uh, functions uh, from acid or from acidosis, I believe, where the body will actually produce small amounts of isopropanol. Now this has been shown, okay, and there are a couple of case studies out there. Uh, one of which actually produced interference on a breath test instrument. 
but I mean, but this is a rare, this is a rare thing. You don't expect to see this a whole lot, okay? But the body can do that. It can produce isopropanol. Isopropanol basically is rubbing alcohol. Yeah, right. No. Okay? But you can drink it. It is relatively toxic. Not nearly as toxic as some of the other alcohols like methanol. Okay? Methanol uh, sterno. You know, you get the hardcore uh, drunks that'll, that'll try to do that stuff. At any rate, uh, this is how we try to detect it, is by looking at these ratios, comparing ratios. Now, Bill was telling you a little bit ago about fuel cells. Fuel cells are great in differentiating hydrocarbons. You get an ethanol-specific fuel cell, all right, and it's not going to detect some of the other stuff that, that will be looked at in this range like toluene, gasoline, all this other crap that, you know, is, is out there, any, any of the hydrocarbons. However, a fuel cell is junk when it comes to differentiating alcohols. The alcohols all look the same to a fuel cell, okay? So if you've got somebody that, in fact, has been drinking Sterno or, or whatever, okay, they're going to show up on a fuel cell, all right? <coughs> Which means it's kind of nice. Use a dual technology. Analyze with both the fuel cell and the and the infrared. I mean, theoretically, you've got everything. But that gets to be a complicated instrument. We're doing it on the DMT, not in Michigan. We're doing it on the DMT. Any other questions on this? Are you completely confused now as to what the infrared is? <laughs> <coughs> I had a question for you. Sure. So the, the fuel cell that detects the hydrocarbon, is that what you said? Pardon? The fuel cell, that's what detects the hydrocarbon? No, fuel cell is not at all sensitive to hydrocarbons, typically, except for ethanol. Okay. They're specific to ethanol. I wrote down that you said 3.44 microns makes the carbon hydrogen bond vibrate. Yeah. So that's that's right. a, we're looking in the hydrocarbon ring. But you're not looking at the carbon oxygen. No, oxygen that's range. up at nine. We right. can't do nine micron. Right. So, but it is. So, what he said is the carbon hydrogen. I think that's meant by hydrocarbon. Okay. Yeah. Is the fuel cell synonymous with the filter? Is no. That the same thing? No. No. It's not. Not. No. So the not fuel even so. detecting ethanol. Pardon? The fuel cells detecting ethanol. Fuel cells detecting alcohol by is detecting the acetone and that, that other part. No, okay, we're, we're confused here. Let's take, the fuel cell is a totally different technology. Totally different. That is used primarily in the handheld units. The fuel cell simply accepts a little bit of alcohol that you blow in. There's a, there's a true chemical reaction in a fuel cell where the alcohol is turned into other chemicals. In the process, it releases electrons. You measure the electrons. And basically, the more electrons that are released, the more alcohol it took to release them. OK? Totally different technology. Infrared uses an infrared lamp, an infrared detector, and filters out the energy by, by means of, a, of, a, uh, of optical filters. Okay. Nobody else confused on that? Good. Sir. Uh, John, when you're, when, when I, get, I think I got a good idea how this works. So once you, uh, the infrared goes to the filters, um, and then it hits the detector, does the detector te detect like a voltage? And is that what it's doing? Or see how much energy is? It's generating a voltage, yes. Yeah. Well, because uh, it sounds like when the, the bonds are rattled, uh, and you have some of that infrared stopping, so you know that uh, I presume the more alcohol in there, the more it's going to stop the infrared from going through. Um, it sounds like, I mean, what is that detector detecting? And then does the machine automatically then make a conversion? So, what, what else? 
Well, yeah, you're down the line and off in one way. <laughs> oh, are you going to die? Uh, yeah, I, basically, what's going to happen is the, the energy that gets through the cell uh, was not absorbed by the alcohol. <coughs> we know how much energy we started with. We know how much, based on the size of that sample chamber and the length, we know how much absorption can, can take place in there. This is the beer Lambert law. Okay? Uh, and, and therefore, we can calibrate this instrument based on whatever terms you want to calibrate. The industry term, the industry standard is 2100 to 1. This is where they want it. And, and basically what that means is there's 2100, uh, 2100 molecules of uh, of air to every one molecule of ethanol. Okay? Now, you know, that gets into a whole other discussion at that point. But we calibrate based on what the code tells us to calibrate at. We don't care. We didn't do the research on it. Somebody else did. Okay? <coughs> 2100 to 1 has been accepted by the legislatures. If you don't like it, go to your congressman. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it's arguable. It is an average. And we were the first people to admit that based on the research that's out there, 5% of the tests that are taken are overstated. That's the way it's set up. <laughs> Okay. Five percent are overstated. Test done on, I guess, any type of drug test. Or Pardon? Data master. So, so what you're saying is five percent of any test done on the data master may be higher than what a person's blood alcohol level. Any drug test. Any drug test. If your palate, if your here's the way this thing works. <clears throat> and this is the way that the, the Dr. Forney's and the Dr. Harger's and all these people, mostly out at Indiana University. See, Michigan's never liked this because they, they would have rather that the work been done at, at Michigan University, okay? but it wasn't. It was done at Indiana University. So you guys got to live with this crap, all right? When you put this, the results of this stuff on a bell curve, and this is the blood breath ratio. How come I'm going blind here? I can't really see that, and I know the camera. No, we're getting. I know, we're getting here, but we're not uh, doing real well. Let's try this one. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Let me try the other black one. I think I may have kept that thing open too long. Kind of got into this, and Bill's numbers are very accurate. They're very good. Uh, this is the accepted science that's out there. <clears throat> if you analyze, however many people doesn't matter. The average has always come to about 2,300 to one. In terms of an exact number, this was actually 2,280. This, the 20 doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Okay, we refer to it as 2300 to 1. If you tried to use that on a breath tester and you went into court, you guys would have a ball. Because that's an average. By its nature, <coughs> half the population is going to be over here, and half the population is going to be over there which means that half are going to be understated, half are going to be overstated. You can't have this. Well, back in the, in the 50s, when they actually were, were trying to convince, I think 59 was the first year they did this, <coughs> when Dr. Forney, Dr. Harger, went to the National Safety Council, all right, they went with, with an idea in mind. Hey, if, if we move this line down 
to here. 2100. Okay. <clears throat> Mathematically, what that does is it puts 95% on this side of the line. 5% over here, which means then that 5% are going to be overstated, 95% are going to be understated. Okay? Now, does anybody know what the significance of that 95% is? That's what they call scientific certainty. That's why they picked that number of 2100 to 1. And what I was going to say earlier, when Jim, when you were asking that question, if we move that line all the way over so that we accommodate the most outrageous and extreme examples of 500 to 1, then it loses all value for everyone that's in that name of 5 now, the other thing you want to keep in mind on this, too, is that you know, a lot of the studies that are cited were done back in the 40s and the 50s. And you see some outliers that are just crazy, like the 500 to 1. All right? I mean, you, you got to you got to say to yourself, is, is any of this due to the technology that was available to these guys in those years? I don't know. You know I wasn't there. But I, I would have to venture a guess that some of the outliners probably were. Because when you look at the more recent research that was done, and I'm talking about the past 10, 15 years, all right, you don't see outliers like that. Right? You just The numbers get tighter and tighter. And I think it's probably because the methodology got better. Perhaps it was said that you know, didn't catch it, but when you say 5% of them are overstated, how much overstated? I mean, do we, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is it material enough to bring up? It's an argument, certainly. Hey, it depends. a lot of it's going to depend on how you bring it up and how you put it in and who you've got to contend with on the other side of the fence, okay? I mean, if, if the prosecutors aren't going to bring an, a, 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 uh, an expert in there to counter your, your guy, <laughs> you could have free reign. I mean, that's our system, okay? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Does the level of alcohol have any function in terms of how those numbers are equated? Can you point oh, eight versus point two? They have the depression. Wait, can you repeat his question or can you say a lot of um, Does the level of alcohol have any function in, in, in this graph or equation versus a 0.08 versus a 0.2? Do those numbers remain constant or did, what, would, what would change in that variable? There are a lot of variables that go into it, okay? The experience of the drinker, the tolerance of the drinker goes into it. <coughs> <coughs> Whether the drinker is a male or a female is going to factor into it. Females have less body, you know, less body water to put it in, and so you have a different ratio for a female. But what what the legislature has said, in essence, is that hey, yeah, you've got all these variables that looks like a good number. Let's legislate it, and that's what was legislated. Sir, hey, John has had. I agree with Bill. You're probably you're one of the most open places to talk to. Has <coughs> identified now, and again, I'm asking questions because I know we have the new DM. That, have you guys identified interference that and eliminated them in the samples? When I say interference, uh, you know we go after it on industrial exposure and, and, and things like that. Have your internal studies? identified interference and one to shut us down or things of that nature. No. Uh, well, the, the, the arguments that you that you typically bring up, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things in this industry that 
and I know it all the time. You never say never. Right. So you don't know. All right. From a practical standpoint, we haven't identified anything that we feel is worth addressing. Okay. But when I need to, okay. So let's just follow it a little bit, a little bit more. And in their <coughs> sample, and when I'm talking about the thing that has always hurt me is is chemical compositions that can get in there. And I, I think you know where I'm going, but industrial exposure. When you're in the, in your range, in your frequency range, your IR range is what I, I call it. Isn't there what I see? What? Isn't there going to have an effect on the region? You think it is? Because what my question is, if they are carbon-hydrogen molecules, for lack of a better word, the device is honed in to look for, are you, you're telling me the carbon or, or the carbon hydrogen oxygen signature of the alcohol molecule? We're looking at the hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon. Okay. okay. We're not looking at the oxygen. Other in, okay. Other interference but could, and we already have identified some of them, have carbon hydrogen signatures that could be in that sample and still reflect as 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 in the can toxic. Can't test every sample. <coughs> the testing that we have done shows that within limits we can detect any A, we can detect the acetone. We can tell you whether or not it's there. We can't detect it down to zero. Nobody can get that there. Okay. <coughs> I think I think you're going to be able to make these arguments probably just about forever. It was uh, the Princeton consistent to put diethyl ether, a, a filter to that, was diethyl ether? Yeah, we're doing 3.5 for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know we're going to identify how that diethyl ether fits into the front that well, except for skin and blue. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah, the, the area of interfering compounds is. It's always been with the industry. It's always going to be there. The industry does certain things periodically uh, to confuse you. Like they add a fuel cell and say, well, now we've got dual technology and we're perfect. Okay, and until you guys get familiar with it and you realize that, well, you still got these low levels that aren't being, you know, that, that you got a range of accuracy you got to work with and a range of specificity, a range of detection of these interferences. <coughs> Generally speaking, these are going to be, your tolerable range is going to be 5% or, or less of the, of the sample. But in the case of some stuff, like methanol, it's going to go up higher because you just can't detect it that easily down at, down at 5%. We can detect it reliably at about 8%. All right? So, you know, these arguments can be made. I mean, the question is, where did your client get the method of all that? Why was he drinking it, for Christ's sake? All right? <laughs> Same with isopropanol. What about glycerol? Pardon? Glycerol. Like sugar and gum, for example. The alcohol. Glycol. What's it called? Glycol. Right. Glycol. Yeah, that's the same stuff that's used in radiation. <laughs> well, it is at that level. Hey, I had that as a defense once. Hey, my do. client was under the car working, and he accidentally swallowed radiator fluid and kept playing for it. Okay, fine. I, <laughs> that's why he was. You know what? I mean, you're making fun. light of it, John. You know, I blew a .02 on Talbos. Is uh, John Tal John Talbos for the last year? Is uh, that a master after chewing winter after the extreme, after chewing? Extra you can do it. Whatever. O2 is, is, as far as I'm concerned, O2 is insignificant. You can eat a, a piece of bread and produce an O2. Okay. This is why you've got a waiting period involved in this, is so that you don't come up with these funny readings like that. Yes. And, and John, I, I'm really uh, curious about that statement about it's uh, a point of zero two that is almost like not enough. Test was over, and I know that we all see these cases all the time. Information violation, the breath test machines, the where the kids come in there, it's 0.01, and then they they violate them on it. And I'm always trying that's, to make the argument. You know, that's a different a, problem than what we do. 
the fact that they're violating a lot of them, I think, is absolutely stupid. Because, because I think this is what's always told by the judge, is that if, if you didn't drink, you wouldn't have, and this would not be a positive reading, but I've always felt like somebody who hasn't drank, it, that could still be within that margin of error. You know, if it's a, and once that person a attempts to, well, a, a point oh one. <clears throat> what are they violating that? Everything? Yeah. 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 The, the accuracy no specification <coughs> of a data <coughs> that we will live with is 0.005. If these get a rate of 0.05 or less, they have no basis whatsoever to violate it because that's within the accuracy specification of the instrument. Now, in real life, do we produce a reading? Probably would, but they don't know that. Okay, 